Hey everyone, and welcome to Biblical Bites. I'm Adam, and I'm excited to be your host alongside my co-host, Allison. Hi everyone, I'm Allison, and I couldn't agree with you more, Adam. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life in a fresh and relevant way, and to tackle everything and anything dealing with the church and the Bible today. So grab your Bible and your headphones and join us as we dive into the rich pages of Scripture, exploring its timeless truths and wisdom. And in the process, we'll help fight against biblical illiteracy, empowering you to live out your faith with confidence and understanding. So let's journey together and deepen our knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. This is Biblical Bites. Hello, Allison. Hey, Adam. How are you? I'm doing well. I'll, t- I'll tell you what. For us, as we're recording this, we are heading into the very last weeks of school for, for our kids and into summer. So my question and opening for us today is, uh, what plans do you have for summer? To sleep. Oh, really? <laughs> I know. I do. Really? Wanna, I feel like my kids absolutely run me ragged during the school year between yeah. all of the activities. And, and I don't want to complain about it because I think it's a busy season, season but it's a blessed yeah. season. But it can make for a tired mom and dad yeah. <laughs> chasing them around. Sometimes Lance and I have to divide and conquer to get to the baseball yep. game and the track meet and the, all the things going on. So I do plan on resting a little bit. Um, but my family and I, we like to travel. And mm-hmm. so um, this year we're going to do North Carolina. Really? Uh, um, yeah, we're going to do a, a week in a cabin in oh, North Carolina. Oh, wow. Yeah, and North I'm really Carolina excited about beautiful. What made you choose hiking. over there? Actually, my husband's boss, um, his wife and he went there with their family last summer, and we were at those Christmas parties, you know, those can be awkward work Christmas <laughs> parties. This is usually pretty sure, fun, but sure. you know, where you're just trying, like he works with all these people, but I see them like once a year, yes, right? At the work right. Christmas party, but his boss's wife, she's precious. She's really sweet. And so she and I just sat together and talked for a long time at the work Christmas party. Mm. Cause you know, it's, I don't know everyone about know her. And she told me all about this vacation that her family had taken to North Carolina. Really? And so I went home and got on TripAdvisor and I'm like, sign me up. Wow. And she talked about how they had a lot of time together and how they like played games. And oh, they she hit all and the keywords. Yes. To I was like a mom's a dream mom. come true. Yes. That makes it. See, I'm, a, I'm at the season of life where it's absolutely the opposite. Okay. Summer brings more chaos because okay. we are all together. <laughs> <laughs> we, I have, uh, for those who don't know, I've, I've got a nine year old, a seven year old and a almost five year old. And so they, um, they're, it's the weirdest thing. I think you were smart in stopping at two <laughs> because we can have any variation of two together and they are wonderful. The moment you add whatever third person individual into it, it is civil war in our house 24 seven all the time. Not <laughs> your so, sweet girls. Oh yeah, they are it's great. <laughs> they are, I love them to death. But parenting, when I realized this, that truth, that parenting is, is um, the most confusing thing in the whole world because you've never loved something and held some thing in your arms that you would in a moment give your life for, but in the very next moment want to throw them out a window. <laughs> And so um, <laughs> chaos, uh, the non-structured uh, summers can often bring a lot of chaos into our lives. So we have to try to find ways to distract. And so we're, we'll, we'll be doing similarly. We actually have some traveling going on. And actually, we have a lot of uh, a lot of things going on this summer with camps. And I'm speaking at a camp. Um, and, and then afterwards, we're going to Arkansas and, and Mississippi with her family. And so it'll, it should be... Uh, It'll, it will blink and it'll be gone. Yeah. But In addition to your girls all being home and you having a lot of activity at mm. home, summer's a busy time for your student ministry. Cause kids are at home and going to camp. and You know, it's really, it's actually kind of funny because it's really, it's busy with camp, but that's it. Okay. Our student ministry, re- I mean, most student ministries, because they're all, all their families are doing what we're doing and traveling mm-hmm. and stuff. We usually, we slow way down in the summer and uh, it becomes more of an intimate time for those who show up. We kind of we can keep it more intimate, but uh, we'll have a break at the end of June and in, into July for everybody to kind of uh, come back geared back, ready to go in August for our student ministry. So it's busy in ways, but then way, way slower in other ways. So it's okay. it's a weird monster to kind of control. <laughs> well, this text that we've been studying in the mm. book of Esther is definitely not moving slowly. No, uh, we're speeding up quick. Esther is a book of reversals yes. and... It's just been a rapid reversal of events in the last couple of chapters that we've studied together. 
Yeah, and Esther has been, I, it's been really fun to, to dive into Esther for me. This is honestly one of the only, this is the first time I've ever really done a d- deep dive in Esther, and I've kind of um, been pleasantly surprised. I don't know why, but I just have been pleasantly surprised with uh, all that Esther holds, and and uh, I, I'm i one who's very, imp- uh, uh, let's see, impressed is not a good word, but I guess impressed by um, how uh, there's multiple layers of meanings and or not meanings, but like uh, they're using themes and patterns and stuff like that to make um, proofs of, of God's work within a text that doesn't even mention God's name. And I think that's been a really fun way to discover all those little ways that you can't you can't deny that God was at work from the start. And, yeah. and so yeah. I think Esther, I've heard it described before as like a beautiful tapestry, mm. um, you know, that's just working together. And sometimes um, from earth, we see like the raw side of the tapestry, yeah. you know, but there's this whole other element of spiritual warfare going mm. on in the big picture um, going on yeah. that God has seen all along. Yes. That's a, uh, well, I'll just continue that line down and just continue to tease my my uh, my ways of wanting to do a symbolic uh, <laughs> reading of Esther at the end of this. So maybe we'll just keep going. He's I trying to convince I'm me. I'm going to convince you. So, um, but uh, we are in Esther chapter eight, um, and we the we were left off with um, this very rapid fire um, downfall of Haman um, at, at a feast, um, that actually we didn't, we didn't really touch on, but, a, a, a feast that mirrored, um, another feast that Esther would do, and, uh, and it mirrors other feasts that took place in, in Esther as well, and so what we're seeing is, again, a, a, um, a, an unfolding of all of these things that have been set up, and now we're watching the unfolding, literally, of, of the second in command with Haman. Yeah, so do you want me to begin, um, by reading, In chapter 8, the very opening lines there, maybe verses 1 through 8. No, thanks. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm going to do it anyway. (laughs) I knew you would. (laughs) It was worth a shot. (laughs) I shouldn't ask your permission. I'm just going to do it. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) The same day King Ahasuerus awarded Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, Mordecai entered the king's presence because, because Esther had revealed her relationship to Mordecai. The king removed his signet ring he had recovered from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther put him in charge of Haman's estate. Then Esther addressed the king again. She fell at his feet, wept, and begged him to revoke the evil of Haman the Agagite and his plot he had devised against the Jews. The king extended the gold scepter toward Esther, so she got up and stood before the king. She said, If it pleases the king and if I have found favor with him, if the matter seems right to the king and if I am pleasing in his eyes, let a royal edict be written. Let it revoke the documents the scheming Haman, the son of Amadatha, the Agagite, wrote to destroy the Jews who were in all of the king's provinces. For how could I bear to see the disaster that would come on my people? How could I bear to see the destruction of my relatives? King Ahasuerus said to Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Look, I've given Haman's estate to Esther, and he was hanged on the gallows because he was he attacked the Jews. Write it in the king's name, whatever pleases you concerning the Jews, and seal it with the signet ring. A document written in the king's name and sealed with the royal signet ring cannot be revoked. Mm. You you did such a great job reading such a difficult uh, set of words and passages. You get an A plus on that. Well, you, thank you. You you, you really Im- overemphasized all of those letters and s- syllables, and I'm impressed by that. I've so. been reading and rereading the Book of Esther in preparation for these good. podcasts, so that probably helps. That's really good. Um, this is a, a very interesting um, passage here, and uh, I, I think one of the things that stands out immediately is there's a lot of repeating phrases that we've been hearing. Um, one was the approach of queen of the queen to the king, um, if it pleases the king, and if he finds favor in your eyes, and I'm pleasing to you, like that kind of thing. And then um, we're also shown um, this idea of the signet ring um, over and over and over again, and this is actually a motif that is used all all throughout from the beginning of scripture up up until Esther at this point, this idea of this signet ring that's been handed over as a sign uh, and seal of authority from the king. And it's been removed from the great Haman, who we found um, left on a pole he erected in his own, uh, in his own yard, apparently. Yeah. And then uh, his, his land or his family or his household is going to be gifted to the one he, who refused to bow uh, to Haman, which yeah. I think is interesting. So it's actually customary in the Persian Empire for um, if there was a traitor or criminal against the state and he was indicted, that the crown or the king um, inherited his estate 
<laughs> immediately. And so um, with Haman's indictment, um, he Xerxes became, um, and he inherited Haman's estate, and then he gifted that right to Esther. Interesting. The opening verses of that chapter. Interesting. Anything else stand out to you? Well, and I think um, one of the things that I love about ch- verse 1 um, is that as it, the, ver- the, the English translation doesn't really capture exactly, I don't think, what happened when Esther revealed her relationship to Mordecai, which mm-hmm. is how the NASB, the version I'm looking at, um, translates it. What I think is probably a better way to say it is he t- she told King Xerxes what Mordecai meant to her. Mm-hmm. And I can just imagine that moment. Um, you know, because we know that they had a warm relationship, Esther and Mordecai, that he was her cousin, but really he was her daddy mm. um, because he had been serving as her father figure for many years. And she had obeyed him um, in many ways. And they had kind of worked together um, in the, since the edict by Haman um, in building up one another and edifying one another mm. and um, urging one another into the call of, of God. And so now she goes to King Xerxes and she's like, let me tell you what Mordecai means to me. And just mm. what a beautiful redeeming moment that must have been for Esther. Yeah, that's I, I didn't even catch that, actually, that you had said that. That is not one of those things that stuck up to me, but that is really, that's I love that. That is amazing. Um, I think this is interesting that it's the first time we see Mordecai actually come before the king himself. This is mm-hmm. That's not happened up to this point. Um, and it wasn't until the conquering of, of the the deceiver, the deceptive one who was attempting to steal, kill, annihilate, destroy, um, hint, hint, the symbolic meanings behind some stuff that we'll get to <laughs> one day. But no, anyways, uh, and so uh, there's um, some really interesting things that, that take place there. And she's still uh, Queen Esther which she is again we revealed last time that it was one the last chapter was one of the first times that we hear that title actually ascribed to her when when being spoken to and it's going to continue that way and i'll follow it up with another question um if you'll notice he when the king um speaks to both mordecai and esther about they talk about queen esther and mordecai the jew um which i think is an interesting distinction to be made that she's both queen esther and he's Mordecai the Jew, um, because we've still yet to see Queen Esther actually say that she is a Jew. She's clearly involved in part of and kindred to, but outright speaking of. And so, um, hint, hint, there could be something more there that, that is being spoken about this Queen Esther and Mordecai distinctively as a, a Jew. Um, which, actually, there's a surprising thing that I, I'd found about that. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you had read anything about this, but the fact that over and over and over again, um, the title, the Jew or Jews will be used um, is a little bit surprising as well, because um, Jews are are ultimately, um, if you're looking um, like genetically uh, descendants of uh, the tribe of Judah, um, which is not the tribe of Benjamin through whom um, uh, Mordecai is actually descendant from. And so for them to be calling him a Jew, they're kind of using it in in a dualistic manner. He is not of the tribe of Judah, but he is of the practices of the Jews. He is a, a um, one who has followed the the ways of what, what we would have termed like the Israelite or the chosen people. But to be a Jew, the shorthand of Judah is has now become encompassing outside of just the tribe of Judah itself. And I just think that's an interesting um, distinction um, to be made for uh, he's actually a Benjamite. Um, for Mordecai to be called, and for Queen Esther to specifically not be titled. Um, and so um, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to that. I don't. We don't have to actually give I anything think, away um, there. But one of the things that I learned about Mordecai being called the Jew is he's actually the only one of God's people in God's word that's given that title. Like yep. it specifically said Mordecai the Jew. People yeah. of other ethnicities or, or nationalities are, are given titles like Hanan the Agagite, yeah. Uriah the Hittite. You know, we can think of a lot of th- times but nowhere else in scripture do we see um, Mordecai the Jew or a name yeah. of the Jew. And I think initially that was in scripture possibly because he wasn't acting like a Jew. Mm. And so the text needed to identify him um, yeah. who was basically assimilated into the Persian culture and yeah. practices as, hey, by the way, this is a Jew, even though he's not acting like one. But we see in this um, great book of reversals mm-hmm. that now the Jew is something um, to to be 
actually identified. It's not something to be yeah. hidden. It's something that it, God's redeeming the Jews, and it's something that Mordecai yeah. takes on for himself. So I like that they continue to call him Mordecai the Jew because there's a reversal yeah. in that title even um, for sure. throughout the, the pages of Esther. Absolutely. And you'll have to wait for a symbolic meaning behind that. <laughs> okay, so um, he's given now uh, all of the, the land, the household, the signet ring. Mordecai has now been elevated up. We, we see this on replay many, many times throughout Scripture. We've alluded to it many times with Joseph. Um, uh, in Genesis, this the same thing occurs um, with re- regards to being elevated up. The humble servant who seems to be working, you know, faithfully behind the scenes, the call that are that's called according to God's purpose is God's plans aren't thwarted by the acts of humans, and the faithful ones are going to be elevated up into um, what will what will uh, be uh, high in, in command, and, and the uh, the bad guy loses loses quite a bit. So, mm-hmm. um, can you think of anything else that you feel like we should cover in that first? Well, one of the things I, I think is really poignant to point out is that we can say that Haman got what he deserved, mm. and that's pretty clear. You know, in the last chapter, he was hung on the gallows that he built. Um, but we can't say that Esther got what she deserved. Really, Esther got more than she deserved. Um, and I think that that's important because it's a picture of grace. Um, so I feel like Esther, she really got um, unmerited favor all throughout the pages of this book. Um, She received a position to what she was unqualified for in a lot of ways. Um, And then she just now we see got an undeserved inheritance um, in that the king decided to gift, you know, the inheritance he received to her. And um, and so that's such a picture of of God's sovereignty and of what grace looks like, because um, in Jesus Christ, we receive unmerited favor and we um, receive a position as um, part of the royal priesthood that, you know, Mm we're not initially qualified for and we receive an inheritance because God says all that he has is ours in Jesus Mm. Christ. And so I think what Esther receives in the opening uh, verses of this chapter is undeserved and it's beautiful grace. Mm. Even though that uh, we'll overemphasize that they're still in the wrong place in the wrong land where they shouldn't be um, uh, uh, with, with regards, they've been able to go back home, but they're here and And uh, and we can see that God's still still moving in Persia, yeah, which is interesting. So, and then he tells um, he tells Esther that she can write an edict, um, but she, you know she begs him to revoke the edict, but he cannot do that. Mm-hmm. He cannot revoke the edict, and remind so remind us why. Because um, in in Persia, and I think this is the case in a lot of kings in antiquity, they couldn't reverse orders. They couldn't reverse laws. And I think historians kind of weigh in on why that would be, but it's to like persuade, uh, dissuade bribes and, and things like that from taking place, for mm. changing their mind. You know, yeah. it was just once it was a law, it was a law. And so, um, again, the, the girl in me who wants – Xerxes to love Esther. I want him to write the edict. I don't want him to give her the pen. Like, at what point is <laughs> right. he going to stand up for her? But, but you know, I'm just reminded that um, God is my defender and my protector. And, um, and the scripture is clear to never point to Xerxes to play that role in Esther's mm. life. Yeah. And I like that because um, I don't need to look to even my wonderful husband to play the role that the Lord needs to play in my life. Yeah. Well, and this is this is a way of reversals. It doesn't mean it's a, necessarily a way of changes. And Xerxes is par for the course of of just constantly being moved by the people who are around them into honestly hasty action. But unfortunate, but fortunately, even in the midst of a ruler who has the ability with the stroke of a pen to take a whole people group away, um, we're we're kind of led to believe that the idea of all the Jews being killed was a surprise. This was clearly a Haman plot. He King seems to be left in the dark, but he he's not changing in his ways. He's just continuing the way that he is and is going to allow Esther, the, the person who honestly is better at being in charge for this at, <laughs> at the moment, um, that opportunity. And so, um, you know, um, God brings up rulers and he tears yeah. down rulers and he, and he puts into place the people that need to be um, to, to perform what he, uh, what he would 
edict himself. Absolutely, because God didn't make Esther queen right. so she could be queen. He didn't yeah. give her that position for the sake of the position. He gave her that position to serve him. Yeah. And that's true of every position that he puts right. his people in. And it, it's a it, it, just as a reminder, thematically, we've talked about how the, one of the main issues that Haman and Mordecai had in the first place was a long, uh, deep-seated um, chronological issue that they had had historically between um, uh, people groups that should have not that should have not had an issue with because um, King Saul should have, um, you know, taken out uh, Agag and, and unfortunately in, in choosing not to, now we see the repercussions where Agag's descendants will attempt to yeah. t- take out the, the descendants. Of and the we're kind of reminded of that in verse five it is when yeah. Haman is again, we're reminded of Haman the Agagite, Agagite. in case you forgot. Yes, Agagite, <laughs> that's a mouthful too. Um, so there's this really cool thing that takes place, and then rather than just reading um, all of the verses, I'd like to just take you uh, best I can. I know this is kind of an audio podcast, um, and it's much easier to see this visually, but there is um, a kind of a one-for-one parallel that's going to be outlined in the remainder of this chapter, um, starting in verse 9. And what we see is that um, starting in verse 9, we're going to see the king's scribes are going to be summoned at that time. Now, this is almost word-for-word word what we saw happen in chapter 3. Starting in verse 12, it says the king's tribes, uh, scribes would be summoned. And then back in verse 8, it'll say uh, on the 23rd day of the third month, that is the month of Sivan. Again, back in chapter 3, on the 13th day of the first month, it's given our time. Letters were written, verse um, chapter 8, letters were written uh, at, at, at Mordecai's dictation to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, officials, 100 and uh, 27 provinces from India to Ethiopia. This all sounds familiar because as you continue down this verse, word for word um, from chapter 3 and the start of chapter 4, um, we are seeing the same thing take place, except through the through different people and a totally different outcome. And there is just one. I want to pause you just for yeah. one second because there is one difference in verse 9 that mm. I think is worth mentioning. So we know that the original edict that Haman put out, like like you said, sounds almost verbatim yeah. um, to this edict that um, Esther and Mordecai are writing. But at the very end of verse 9, it says, um, for each ethnic group in his own language, which mm-hmm. was true of Haman's edict as well. And then it has this phrase, and to the Jews in their own script and language, mm. which was not part of the first yeah. edict that Haman put out. And you know why I don't think it was? Because I don't think the Jews were, were speaking Hebrew <laughs> a lot. Like They had assimilated into the Persian Empire, and so they had probably also been speaking you know, whatever language was was persian a language uh yeah they, yeah uh it had its own language i think it would have actually been um uh, uh not akkadian um it slips in my mind sorry i put you on the spot cause no, i don't okay. know what language they were speaking in the persian uh, empire what was the common language but i think i imagine the jews were speaking that language and not hebrew but now they're beginning to reassume their national identity as god's people and so i think that um Esther and Mordecai chose to include that edict in the Hebrew language and the Jewish language, not because they needed it in order to read it, but just as a statement that they were um, reaffirming themselves as God's people. That's interesting. I, I I enjoy that as well. I think that's a that's a really good way to say this. I just Googled this. It says Persians at least originally spoke Old Persian. Okay. There you go. <laughs> a dialect of Iranian, Median, the Median. Uh, anyways, so... Okay. Uh, Darius commanded the script. Yes. So anyways, uh, so it's written in Hebrew as well. And it's something that we, um, that would stand out here at that moment. Yeah. Let me pull back up my note here so I don't lose Sorry, it I here. got you off no, course No, no, you didn't. No, there. that was it. Because um, what you did was you pointed out the fact that um, th- th- oftentimes it's in the changes. Yeah. Especially when there's going to be a word, almost a word for word um, copying from an earlier thing. What you're, what you're meant to do is to look for the changes. And so, yes, this addition, like what we had found with regards to Esther in the last chapter being um, titled Queen Esther, you know, uh, over and over again, this is something we hadn't actually seen. It had always been either the queen or or Esther and never Queen Esther. And so it's making a a, a statement. And one of the main statements that we see in the midst of this particular edict um, is the outcome will be, um, again, opposite as well, where um, in chapter 4 it'll say in every province that the king's command 
and decree reached, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing and everybody laid in sackcloth and ashes. And the end of this one will say that the Jews enjoyed light and gladness, happiness and honored in every province, province uh, and in every city with the king's command. And the decree, once the decree arrived, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many of the people of the land professed to be Jews for the fear of the Jews had fallen, uh, had fallen upon them. Um, and so not only do we see uh, a, a reinvigoration towards their ethnic and religious culture of being Jews, but we're seeing many are also um, professing now who maybe even would have never professed to be Jews are professing to be Jews because of the fear of the Jews, um, which I think is an interesting thing to note. Do you think those were genuine professions? Oh, I don't dare step in that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I would probably lean towards I, it's out of fear. So I would fear I'd be fearful of um, whether that is accurate or not. Yeah. But, you know, um, I think they were pretending. And you want me to yeah. tell you what I'm basing that off oh, of? No. So at the beginning, I'm taking it. Great. So at, at the beginning of the story, cause this is about reversals, right? Yeah. Esther and Mordecai pretended they weren't Jews. Mm. And now we see a reversal and people pretending they are. Interesting. So they're the cool kids on campus now, yeah. and everyone wants to be like them. Yeah. The problem is, is that, um, and th this is where, uh, uh, so for me, this is one of the things that um, has ever become increasingly clear to me, is that we kind of brought up, and I can't remember if it was this podcast or the last one, how we, we love to write ourselves as the heroes mm -hmm. in, in the stories. And the Bible is pretty good about um, kind of tearing those walls down. And that was actually a theme that we really, talk, uh, we really um, talked about early on in this podcast uh, over Esther um, series. It was that this isn't necessarily the princess story, too. And because what we're seeing is that we're seeing, wow, God was in control and he protected his people. And that is cause for celebration. But at the end of the day, th we're still, it's still broken. The system's still broken. Um, the, the king can't uh, undo the edict. He can create a new edict. This new edict will be a way for the people to um, protect themselves from the potential coming destruction. Um, and in the midst of that um, um, edict, uh, we are reminded that there's still a death that's taking place. Um, and it's not just Haman. In fact, this will this will and it won't even just be a small death. It won't it'll be a, a, a large loss of life. And I think that it's important that we take a, a few moments um, every, when we read things like this to realize, like, yeah, read from the hero's perspective, that's great because these guys were enemies and wanted to kill the Jews. But read from the perspective of the divine or of God's perspective, it's still loss of human life, um, human life that he created as well. Um, and you can see why painstakingly looking through the, the narratives that precede this, like going back to when King Saul should have taken out Agag, you can see a God who loves and cares for his creation so much that he's constantly trying to get the people not to choose what they think is right and to listen to his wisdom and to protect what will come in the future with regards to not just the the potential loss of his people, the Jews, but also the loss of life in general. Um, it is still a death. It is still um, um, something that is to be mourned. And it, it, it leads for a very confusing last couple chapters because we're going to be told about this death and we're going to be told about how vast this death is. But on the other hand, it, we're also going to be told about the celebration that we're going to be telling in regards to this death. And, and no matter what, there leaves a cliffhanger of the problem still not fixed. Mm -hmm. There's still death. There's still destruction in this land that, that we um, exist and live in. And for some reason, this feels familiar because we've seen it in the past in these old stories, but it also f still feels familiar to us because it's not that um, out of the ordinary um, for a, a world leader to get it in his mind to just take out a whole people group and to try to to try to annihilate them because of some sort of a personal um, uh, vendetta against them. In fact, I just read, not to change the subject for just a second, but then, then we can go back and, and finish wherever you'd like to. <laughs> um, but I just read, or I was just talking about um, um, the um, character in history that uh, 
Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula is based off of. Okay. Are you familiar at all? No. Great. It's this guy, and I bet if I say his name, you'll probably recognize him, but it's this guy named Vlad the Impaler. Okay. He lived in the, I think it was like the uh, fourth century or something. Anyways, he um, was one of these that we would probably ascribe to um, uh, a, a antichrist type Mm -hmm. um like nero was um and and we would even go back to egypt uh in pharaoh pre-jesus but um he was known for um going into land and he wasn't the strongest he wasn't the greatest his name literally means um the the mighty one i think is what it means and it and uh uh, he is of the family of dracula so he's of the seed of the dragon of literally um in in, in the language that they speak in Romania, uh, it means um, the uh, the seed. He's the seed of the um, uh, of the devil, and he would go around into hit into these um, surrounding nations, and he would erect these large um, stakes like this and impale everyone, like literally everyone. He, they're talking possibly hundreds of thousands of people in his time, um, and. Um, it's just funny because what we see from the opening pages of the Bible is in the Cain narrative is when people choose not to rule their sin, the beast takes control. And the beast, his game is just, it looks similar and the same over and over and over again in, in, in more magnified ways. Um, and just like um, we would get, by the time we get to like Hitler and these other Antichrist type figures, it makes sense that why in the end, end of end, end times, um, this Antichrist figure will look a certain and horrific and horrible way. Well, we've, we've seen this. We've seen it all throughout Scripture. We're watching it in Esther. And at the end of the day, the problem is still um, that death. Mm-hmm. Death is still going to come. Wrath is still going to be coming, and in God's ways and uh, are greater than man's ways. But man's ways love to steal, kill, destroy, and yeah. annihilate. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned that um, this book, in a way, kind of leaves us on a cliffhanger, mm. right? Because yeah. there's still death and destruction at the end of the book, and that that follows a pattern mm-hmm. in much of the Old Testament. And obviously we know that that was intentional. I mean, we can recognize it was intentional because it's a pattern. But I think um, we can also recognize being on this side of the cross, the purpose of that intention. Um, Because a cliffhanger leaves you yearning, leaves you longing, leaves you looking forward. Um, That's why they end season on cliffhangers, right? So you tune back in next season. Maybe we should consider doing that. They don't do (laughs) do that anymore, though, Like since you can binge everything. I think we should do it. Okay. Well, so um, so the reason that the Old Testament and many of the stories in the Old Testament, I think, leave us on a cliffhanger is because um, it, it's designed to, to point forward yep. to yep. Jesus. Um, and, and it's interesting, and this is probably a, a bigger conversation for another day, but I'll just dip my toes in it today. I had a question um, at the end of our Bible study that I taught, I teach the women on Wednesday mm-hmm. nights at our church, and one of the women raised their hand and asked that question. Um, that we've probably heard before, how did people in the Old Testament get saved? And Mm. that's a really difficult and complex question that I can't really do justice to today. But um, the short answer, in my opinion, would be they did it by looking forward to the cross, and Mm. they recognized the need. Maybe they didn't know exactly. There was lots of prophecies, over 300 in the book of Isaiah, that explicitly explained what was going to happen. But hindsight is 20-20. And um, as those people um, lived in that time period, they may not have understood exactly what they were looking forward to, but they had a longing for a savior that was unlike any earthly king. Um, And they saw this pattern repeat in history over and over again. And they looked forward to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, lots of people in the Old Testament did that. There's a whole chapter, Hebrews 11, Mm -hmm. um, in the New Testament that points out Abraham, for example, by faith, Abraham Mm -hmm. believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so these cliffhangers in the Old Testament um, those longings that leave people waiting for the Savior, they placed their faith in that, and that's how they were saved in the Old Testament. So those cliffhangers yeah. were as important to the people in the Old Testament as they are for us to recognize today. Yeah, that's uh, so, so well written. And in that pattern that we see with Abraham being faithful is is the same one that we're gonna that we saw um, previous to this with Joseph, with the other narratives that we tied it to with David, with Daniel, and now with Esther. It's this idea that. The ones who are faithful and are trusting of uh, uh, of God's ways and choose not the world's ways, they're the ones that are credited, that are given a pre-done credit towards their salvation. And and 
uh, one way that I do explain that to, to some others who talk about that is that you have to remember that when God created things, he created time, a chronological linear timeline of things. That means he exists outside of time. So the works of God, they supersede the linear time frame of things. So the work on the cross is good yesterday, today, yeah. and tomorrow. And so you're right. The ones who were in those previous timelines like Esther pre-Jesus are yearning and looking forward. And at the moment of the conquering of the cross, that salvation was was good to cover um all directions of time yeah. and space and I love and, that because yeah. it's all about Jesus whether you're looking forward mm-hmm. like Esther or you're looking back like us yep. it's always been about Jesus and it's and it's important to see those um, connections because we still exist in the same time frame in in exile apart from where we should be under the the control of what what would we would consider the beast and we're seeing the same things take place at a greater level than we've ever imagined more babies are killed you know yearly than than there are in all wars like combined you know and we we just got out of the bloodiest century in all of time and and this is what happens when the powers of darkness the ones who come to steal, kill, and destroy are uh, seemingly in power, but we read these and go, uh, no, like, you don't think he is. God doesn't even have to be mentioned. If you're looking, he's working, and we uh, are to remain faithful to, to that God who's truly in control. And I have another example of a way, if you're looking, that you're yeah. going to clearly see God in chapter 8 of Esther, yeah, um, this chapter. So um, we notice that Mordecai, when he, after he wrote the edict and a copy was sent out, all across Susa. And so just to go back uh, one step and give you a little timeline, because some of our our listeners may find this interesting. So Mordecai and Esther's edict was written 70 days after Haman's edict. Mm. Um, And so now we're at now we're at nine months until the Jews are supposed to be killed, destroyed and annihilated. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it takes about three months for a message to reach, historians think, to every border of the Persian Empire. So they set out speedily to disseminate Mordecai and Esther's edict, and then giving the Jews, I guess, about six months to prepare themselves, to defend themselves, because that was a difference between Haman's edict and Esther and Mordecai's edict. Um, Whereas Haman's edict was, um, it was actually the only difference. Haman's edict said that it would destroy, kill, and annihilate the men, women, and children. Esther and Mordecai's edict um, actually used the same terminology, but they weren't permitted to attack. They were Mm. only permitted to defend or avenge in Esther and Mordecai's edict. And then after that edict was disseminated, it says that Mordecai went out from the king's presence, but he went out dressed in clothing that the king had Mm. given him. And the clothing was um, in verse 15 of chapter 8. It says that Mordecai went from the king's presence clothed in royal blue and white with a great gold crown and a purple robe of fine linen. And um, if we look in Exodus chapter 28, particularly verses 1 through 6, um, that's very much how God commanded Aaron the priest yeah. to be dressed and go out before God's people. And so I think that um, that's one reason when Mordecai ascended from the king's palace and were greeted by the Jews in Susa that they rejoiced so much because they saw Mordecai standing like a priest and they recognized it as God's favor that mm. he had perhaps appointed a priest in Mordecai to stand between them and King Xerxes. Mm. And, um, and so all throughout the book of Esther, we can see undertones of hope and God at work. Yeah. Proverbs eleven ten: when the righteous prosper, the city exalts. When the wicked perish, there shouts for joy, which I think is um, quite, quite relevant here as Absolutely. far as that goes. Well, I think uh, we've not we've not by any means um, left no stone unturned, um, but we have, I think, uh, hopefully wet the whistle yeah. of, of a listener into... Um, um, just continuing seeking, looking for where God's at work in this narrative and how this story of reversals is, is one that we get to still um, um, keep uh, at the forefront of our, our life because that's what, that's what Jesus did for us. He, he created a story of reversals for us. And, he did. And uh, now we get to remain faithful and hopefully uh, recognize those for such a time as this time in our own lives. And, you know, we don't have to do it alone. God yeah. has created um, a community of believers. Mm. 
And and in that edict um, that Esther and Mordecai wrote, you know, they did write to defend themselves, but they also gave Jews the right to assemble. Mm. And perhaps that was even a more powerful right than defending themselves um, because there's power and coming together with God's people. They're like the Avengers now. Yeah. <laughs> but, and they're, you know, and, and the, pa- yeah. like the Bible says when two or three are gathered, you know, in yeah. my name that I'm there. And, um, and so, and I think that's kind of what part of what we're trying to do here with biblical bites. Yeah. But, um, I love that this story is written in community, um, of believers and, and how important that is in, def- in fighting the enemy and serving the Lord is that that's done among community. Yeah. So if you'd like to be a part of our Biblical Bites community, um, there's a great way you can do that. You can get on Facebook to Biblical Bites with a Y, Bites with a Y, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, uh, get online and just let us know that you're here and that you, you, if you've got questions, we'd love to hear those questions. If you've got suggestions for future podcast episodes, we're always open to that because... You know, we love to be able to give people what they what they are yes, really interested in. Absolutely. That helps us out. So, yeah. Um, well, we are uh, getting ready to uh, head into summer. And uh, I think this is a good way to wrap up one more episode, I think, at least to wrap up Esther. Um, and we will um, you stay tuned because we'll leave you on a cliffhanger until the last yes. two last two chapters here and, uh, and Esther and then. Um, if you get on Biblical Bites and you try to convince Allison to let me <laughs> do a symbol, symbol, uh, symbol, I can't say it. It's not happening. I, I don't think you should. I want to say if logical. If you cannot learn the word, I Why say no. It it's symbolical. symbolic, Adam. Symbolical. No, that's <laughs> not a word. I have logic in my symbology. I'm uh, we'll just see. I, that's to be determined. That I know that that I will just actually say that one's for Miss Sheila because I like to create words in her okay. presence because then Sheila is just she just loves it when I do that. So symbolical. <laughs> Okay, episode. well, that's for Miss Sheila. She's precious, and so she's going <laughs> to let you get away with that. I will not. Oh, fine. <laughs> All right. But I will let you pray. I appreciate that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that we got to spend in your word. I pray that you will um, help us to recognize those moments that you've made us for. Help us to remain faithful to your calling, to what you would say is wise and true and edifying, God. Help us to stay in the word. Uh, may it continue to be what it causes, or what it calls itself, a, a light uh, and into our dark path, Father. As we exist in this world, uh, you know, in exile, I pray that we can, um, in our own little ways, um, be the Esthers, be the Mordecais, in whatever scenario and situation you put us in. Ultimately, God, that we can glorify the work, um, the grace, and the blessings that you've um, bestowed upon us, and and give to you credit um, where that credit is truly due. Father, it's in these things we ask it. Amen. Amen.